Thank you. Dr. Hoyt, Dr. Stewart, members of the Committee of Trauma, and all of you, I am deeply honored to be able to deliver this year's Scudder Oration on Trauma. As I looked at the theme of the 2016 College of Surgeons set by Dr. David Richardson, one of my mentors, it was challenges of the second century. I think disaster surgery is going to be one of those challenges. And I hope the presentation to you today will make it worthwhile. I'm also particularly honored because in addition to the fact that Dr. Scudder was a leader in the American College of Surgeons and Committee of Trauma, he was also a renowned surgeon at my hospital in Boston, Massachusetts General Hospital, in the early 1900s, a little before I was born. Sharing our surgical expertise in disasters is really not only our responsibility, but it is also a unique privilege. It has been one of the most rewarding parts of my 40-year surgical career, and I hope that after seeing this presentation, many of the young surgeons will also involve themselves in it, either locally, nationally, or internationally. Over the past century, surgeons really have expanded the number of disasters, many of them complex, that they have responded to. Surgeons responding to disasters need three things. Surgical skills, a passion, and the ability to work outside their comfort zone, which to me has been the hardest thing in all of my experiences. I would like to share with you some of the past and present initiatives where surgeons have made a unique difference in their response to a disaster. In World War I, our founder, Frank Martin, organized surgical teams to respond to the war. Of interest is that the medical teams deployed two years in advance of the combat troops, really illustrating the necessity for disaster medical preparedness in war and other disasters. In World War II, the War Department again stepped up and asked academic institutions, many of them from your institution, to respond. Leaders of the American College of Surgeons and the COT responded to this challenge. Dr. Claude Welsh, one of our past presidents, led a team in Rome and was a senior consultant. Dr. Edwin Churchill was the chief consultant in North Africa and author of the famous book, Surgeon to Soldiers. These are just two of the many people who responded to the challenge at that time. As all of you know, valuable lessons have been learned from war. But we've also learned from man-made disasters. And I would like to show you two that have significantly impacted our surgical practice. In Halifax, Canada, 1917, there was an explosion of a munitions ship due to a collision in Halifax Harbor. It was, at that time, the largest man-made explosion until the Hiroshima bomb. And obviously, the World Trade Tower bombing had greater fatalities. There were 2,000 fatalities and 9,000 casualties. Teams of surgeons from Boston, where the nearest city, responded to this disaster. And out of it, Dr. William Ladd, who at the time was a young surgeon at Boston City Hospital, was so moved by the injuries to children and the death of over 500 children that he developed all of his energy in the future to establishing and developing the subspecialty of pediatric surgery. The Coconut Grove nightclub fire in Boston 
492 hundreds injured. The disaster came at a very unique time in the history of burn care. Many of our techniques were antiquated, and it resulted in significant changes in the care of burns by surgeons. The lesson I would like to leave with you today as I take you through some real disasters is that trauma surgeons of all specialties are uniquely qualified to participate in every aspect of disaster response, not just operative care. You make re decisions rapidly, you triage every day, you resuscitate the acutely ill, damage control, a key in our everyday trauma centers, is, is actually one of the milestones of disaster care and critical care. There are four major concerns in disaster medical response, and surgeons can handle all of these and should be involved. Definitive surgical care, obviously, is one of our milestones. It usually occurs in mobile or fixed facilities. This shows you our US field hospital in Haiti. And on the other side, the Israeli team operating in a schoolhouse during the Turkey earthquake. You can take your surgical skills any place. One of the real challenges of disaster surgery is it's not only emergency surgical care, which is sometimes the easiest unless it's outside of our comfort zone. But you always get, particularly in austere environments, essential, often neglected surgical care, which is a real challenge. The challenge is not when to operate, the challenge is when not to operate, particularly in austere environments where patients are not likely to survive or the care is not sustainable. Disaster surgical care really requires a fundamental change in the way we practice. This has been termed crisis management care by the Institute of Medicine, which now is the Health and Medicine Division of the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Crisis management care is minimally acceptable care. This is what we do every day with our damage control surgery. So we of all specialties are uniquely positioned to take these skills into complex disasters. What we've learned from disasters is that surgery will make a difference, but it needs to follow these four things. And probably the hardest for us who live in well-developed countries is the care we give must be sustainable in the host country. In the Haiti earthquake, they had a palliative committee. People with massive crush injuries of the pelvis in a country with no rehab were deemed palliative. The same thing happened in the Sichuan earthquake in China. One of the changes is that today's disaster teams are based on functional capacities, not titles. This allows us to easily work, even with language difficulties, as I'll show you, with responders from other organizations, both civilian and military. One of the most important things for each and every one of you is to develop your partnerships in advance of an actual disaster. Good intentions alone are not sufficient. There are a lot of partnerships out there, and you need to choose one that matches your abilities, both in terms of time to respond, commitment, and your surgical skills. I would like to show you one that I am particularly proud of as it partners academic trauma centers with the U.S. government. This has been a successful partnership for surgeons. The national disaster system in our country is our congressionally mandated disaster plan. Many countries have similar plans. One of the key elements established in 1999 by myself and a number of trauma surgeons, such as Dr. Ron Mayer, Dr. Eileen Bulger, and other well-known names, is the International Medical Surgical Response Team, or IMSERT. 
In 2017, they're changing the name to Trauma and Critical Care Teams to reflect a much broader scope of liaisons with the military, especially in the area of critical care response. These are regional teams affiliated for the first time in history with academic trauma centers paired with the U.S. Health and Human Services. There are three. I allege that the first one, since I helped found it, was in Boston, pure nepotism. The other, when you do things free, you pick your friends. Ryder Trauma Center and Seattle with Harborview. What is the MSERT? We are a deployable, rapid assembly field hospital, which we need to set up ourselves. We don't have 18-year-old soldiers, unfortunately, like the military. But this has the capacity for all of those key elements that I discussed, initial stabilization, operative, critical care, and very important, the capacity to evacuate critical care patients. We are federalized. We are multidisciplinary surgical specialists. I would like to show you two of the complex international disasters that our team responded to. I think it illustrates the critical role of surgeons in disaster response, but also how difficult it often is to work outside of your comfort zone. The earthquake in Bamaran was in 2003. As many of you will remember, it was not exactly a good political climate. In fact, we had people who were uncomfortable going, and I certainly respect that. 41,000 people dead, tens of thousands injured, and nearly all of the survivors left homeless in tents like this. 34 search and rescue teams responded and 13 international field hospitals, the U.S. included, surprisingly. And this is why functional requirements are essential in order to allow us to work with the other responders in today's complex disaster. This was our team. We'd like to thank the Air Force, who always takes us every place. Unfortunately, due to the political climate, they could only take us as far as caravan Iran. We then went in with Iranian, Russia, and French planes to Bam Iran. This is our field hospital. We set it up ourselves. The first night, there were 400 men watching us, and we thought, oh, they want to see the U.S. team. Not true. In Iran, male and female do not do physical work together. So this was a change. We had to change some of our traditional setup due to cultural constraints. It's important to remember we are always guests in a country in a disaster. We normally have minor, major, operative, and children. Because males and females could not be treated together, we had male, female, operative, and children. One of the things I've learned, which was painful, is that I had to relearn some of the skills that I had as a surgical resident. And one of the most common is emergency cesarean section, which I had not done since I was a PGY2, but I have a great checklist, and I've read about it, and I've done them. And that's something you always encounter in disasters. Life goes on. This was the biggest lesson for me outside of my comfort zone. This was a six-week-old child who came in in full respiratory arrest, no parents, with secondary smoke, opium inhalation. And the reason is the adults were in a tent, a temporary tent, and they smoked opium just as we do tobacco. What we didn't realize before we left and got there is that BAM was a crossroads of the opium trade from Afghanistan. So it was clearly easily available it was not in my differential diagnosis. When the parents finally came in, we were able to ascertain that that was a problem and give them Narcan. But this was something none of us had encountered. The Haiti earthquake was the second one for our insert teams. All of you remember the devastation of this. 2000, 
200,000 deaths, a million homeless. This was our field hospital. We were next to refugee camp of 25,000 people, which accounted for the significant amount of violence that we saw, as the gangs and the escaped prisoners were also part of that. We were guarded by the 82nd Airborne, again illustrating the necessity for civilian military cooperation in all large disasters. We were in a hot zone and could not go out, even with a evacuating patients without six of the 82nd Airborne. In six weeks, with multidisciplinary surgeons, we saw 3,000 patients, did 300 operations just in our field hospital. And one of the things we learned is that we are too reliant on nurses with conscious sedation. We need to become proficient with that. There was no wound clinic. They came back to the hospital every day for their wound change. Not surprisingly, 50% was orthopedics, 50% general surgery. And that was pretty true of most big earthquake disasters. Our operating room would never have passed inspection, but it was very, very effective. The earthquake injuries were actually some of the easy to take care of because that's in our comfort zone. One of the reasons that we have multidisciplinary teams is that you really are the only caregiver in many of these disasters. So what did we see? We saw violence. The gangs were vicious, not only to their own people, but outside people. So nightly, despite a curfew, we had a large number of gunshot wounds, stab wounds, and this young kid who was hit by a rescue vehicle and in our critical care unit. Neglected surgery is always a factor, such as this young woman who came in and presented with bowel obstruction, no scars, and it turned out to be a ruptured ovarian tumor. Pediatrics was a real challenge, but it also illustrates to me the value of our ATLS courses. This was a young year and a half infant who was carried in in his mother's arms, comatose, strictly from dehydration due to the heat and dust. Interosseous infusion, a skill now taught in our ATLS courses and utilized frequently in disasters, saved this child's life, as you see here. Obstetrics, certainly to me, was outside of my comfort zone, particularly since 90% of the people came in in a full eclampsia due to lack of prenatal care and a heart rate of 40. I am more anxious putting a knife over a child's head than operating on a stab wound of the heart, as I suspect many of you are. We did a large number of emergency C-sections. And one of the things you learn is to learn from lessons from other people. Reported in the military literature about 10 years ago was the use of MREs, Meals Ready to Eat heating pad, as a heating mechanism. That's what we used for all our premature children. We didn't have incubators. Endemic diseases were also a great challenge, not only to our caregivers, we didn't have a microbiology lab, but to patients. And to me, of all of them, tetanus was a real challenge to me outside of my comfort zone. I had never seen someone with full-blown seizures from tetanus. Equally tragic were the cases of neonatal tetanus, which were palliative in Haiti. There were no respirators other than one bird respirator in Port-au-Prince throughout the country for children. Therefore, their care was palliative, much like premature infants. Adult tetanus was a challenge, and one of the things you learn in disasters is to be quite creative. Many of you who may have treated tetanus, I have not, know that you need to keep them in a dark room to decrease stimulation and minimize spasms. We did not have a dark room in our field hospital, so the box was our solution. 
And this was a young fellow who had a simple puncture wound of his foot, neglected for 10 days till he got to a hospital, resulting in amputation and then full-blown tetanus. Evacuation was a real challenge. Some of you may recognize Dr. Eileen Bulger, who's handbagging a premature infant and getting ready to evacuate by helicopter this child to the comfort, which was an amazing asset, as the military always is. I've shown you the past and the present, so what is the future in terms of expanding our opportunities to deploy as trauma surgeons in disaster? The key is collaborative initiatives. Disasters today are too complex. I'd like to highlight three initiatives. As many of you remember, the Board of Governors, under the leadership of Dr. Andrew Warshaw, my boss in the past, established Operation Giving Back as an initiative for surgical volunteerism. It was really more global health than it was acute care surgery. Now, under the leadership of Dr. Germa Tafera, Operation Giving Back is achieving a leadership role in disaster preparedness and response. And we're particularly grateful not only to Dr. Tafera, but to Dr. Peggy Knudsen, who's serving as our liaison with the military to bring together our collaborative efforts. So what are they currently doing? They will be a coordinating body for the American College of Surgeons of requests from various organizations, government and non-government, needing functional categories of surgeons for disaster response. And exciting at the response and with encouragement of the AAST, we have helped them develop a trauma registry based not on titles but functional capacities. This reflects better current day trauma surgery. So far, just from AAST and East, we have over 250 people registered. Orthopedic trauma has a similar registry, so we hope that we will be able to put together our professional organizations from various subspecialties to meet whatever the demand for surgeons is. Military civilian initiatives, to me, are critical particularly in austere environments and international disasters. Many of you remember an excellent, excellent initiative of the Senior Visiting Surgeon Program. A number of our senior surgeons, Dr. Knudsen, Dr. Moore, uh, Dr. Mayer, and others participated in this. And it was really to backfill Lonstool so that the active duty could go and fight the war. 192 surgeons responded from the Surgery of Trauma and the Society of Vascular Surgery. And these are two excellent references if you want to read more about it. I would say, and I hope, this will be the start of real collaboration and not separation between our military and civilian surgeons. There also are international initiatives. In 2016, the World Health began the process of developing emergency medical teams, which many of you may have heard about. These are volunteer teams, either with governments, nonprofit organizations, or hospitals. The U.S. is not currently involved in that from the point of view of our government. These will work in conjunction with and at the quest of WHO's regional partners, such as the Pan American Health Organization. I think it remains to be seen what the impact of this will be, but it certainly is an attempt to identify assets and surgery from other countries and put them together. So in summary, I think the lesson that I have learned and why it is really a privilege to respond to disasters is that everyone is our neighbor, regardless of any politics, cultural, or geographic constraints. It is often difficult, particularly if we think it is not the way we practice medicine, but we need to be aware of this and be there for our neighbors. So I'm honored to say that today's surgeons, many of you both locally and disasters such as Dallas, Orlando, Boston, 
have really taken up the challenge. And I hope this presentation will stimulate many of the young surgeons in the audience to incorporate some element of disaster surgery in their future surgery careers. It will be one of the most rewarding aspects and it certainly will be dramatically needed as we go into the second century. I would particularly like to thank a few people, Dr. Don Trunke, who could not be here today, Dr. Dave Richardson, who really gave me a number of the trauma skills early in my career that allowed me to take them to disasters, both locally and throughout the world. And I would like to thank my three bosses, Dr. Jerry Austin, Dr. Andy Warsher, and Dr. Keith Lillimo, who never said no when I asked to follow my passion and respond to disasters throughout the world. Thank you for the honor of presenting the Scudder Oration on Trauma.